Hi everyone, in today's video I'm going to walk you through the process of collecting data for SPT hammer calibration. I'll also talk about its importance in geotechnical engineering practice, so let's get started. I'm going to talk through this short video segment step by step of what we're doing. So typically the hammer calibration is done at a project site like this one. It can also be done in the drill yard. This is a wastewater treatment plant. We start out by getting the project information, information about the rigs. So he's taking out our instrumented AWJ rod. It comes with two strain gauges from the manufacturer and then we'll bolt on the accelerometers. You'll want to get a rod that's appropriate for your drill rod size. It has to be consistent. So most people uh, in the Midwest anyway use either AWJ or NW rod. So we have a rod for each of those sizes, this instrumented sub-assembly as they call it. So you can see he's orienting, orienting the accelerometers in a vertical position. As it's sitting on the table, that's how it'll set on top of the string of drill rods. So he's just getting everything nice and tight, but not overly tight. Doesn't want to strip out the, the tapped holes in the rod. So now he's connecting everything up to a splitter cable. So we've got four channels, two accelerometers, two strain gauges. And then in a moment, he'll connect these to a main cable. We use cable data acquisition for SPT hammer calibration. So he's just getting everything organized right now. We use our SPT, or we use our PDA computer for doing this work with uh, specialty software that's been added to it. So he's just checking everything over one last time here. All right, so that's what the fully assembled rod ready for testing looks like. So normally it only adds about five minutes to each sample interval. So we'll typically collect SPT data every five feet. So they're just augering down to their first sample interval, which would probably be a few feet below the ground surface with that solid stem auger. Then they go in with their SPT uh, sampler and the drill rod, and he's connecting his instrumented sub assembly to that. Now he's connecting his main cable to the splitter cable. Just connects there. Normally we'll have somebody hold the cable assembly up from the ground so that the impact forces isn't causing extra strain on the connectors. Again, that's our typical practice. I think this one sample interval, they, they did it with the cables just laying on the ground there, which is fine. I just prefer to hold them up. So you can see they're driving in the rod at six inch increments. They're counting the number of blows for each six inch increment. Typical practice is to drive either three increments or four. And of course your end value is the sum of the last two six inch increments. Then he disconnects the main cable after that sample interval is completed. Unthreads the rod, takes it back to his table. They'll pull their, their rod and their SPT sampler and then go back down the hole with the auger and draw it to the next sampling depth. And the process is repeated. And a good practice, you can see what he's doing here is he's tightening uh, his connection of the accelerometers to the rod because there's several thousand G's that are applied when the impact to the rod occurs from the hammer. So the whole idea with this test is that we're measuring the force on the drill rod during the SPT sampling. So it's a 140 pound weight. That's uh, the hammer, internal hammer. Most of these are safety hammers on these drill rigs and it has a drop height of two and a half feet. So the maximum potential energy is 350 foot-pounds and we'll measure the actual energy with the strain gauges and accelerometers with our data acquisition system. And typical efficiencies for a drill rig with an auto hammer is usually in the low 80s. But this is important because the correlations that were developed, you know, geotechnical engineering developed as an empirical science with uh, people like Carl Tersagi and Ralph Peck. And they observed certain foundations that were constructed that were successful and those that weren't. And they would correlate 
those types of outcomes with subsurface investigations and subsequent laboratory testing. And back in, you know, really 40s, 50s, 60s, clear through perhaps to the 80s, a lot of uh, drill rigs came with a cat head and rope. So it wasn't an auto hammer, it wasn't a safety hammer. So there was a lot of variability in the amount of energy delivered to the drill rod. It, it was dependent on how clean the cat head drum was, how old was the rope, was it used, uh, was it, did it have grease on it, was the uh, driller tired so he put more than the two and a quarter wraps on the cat head so it was easier to, to pull the hammer up. So for all that reason, there's wide scattered, but it was generally established that the efficiency of those type of sampling, the efficiency of those type of samplers was about 60%. So again, a lot of the early engineering studies and correlations were essentially done with blow counts that were collected with 60% efficiency of the hammer. Fast forward to today, again, typical hammer performance or efficiency typically ranges from 80 to 100%. And I've seen where some manufacturers tend to have higher rated energy than others. It could be a slight difference in the weight, although it's usually a difference in the fall height. Uh, if the hammer is picked and thrown up slightly at a high operation speed, it can increase the drop height and increase the amount of energy. So again, you're assuming a fixed theoretical energy of 350 foot pounds. But let's just say with the normal 80 some percent efficiency that you had a blow count of eight. Well, if you determined that the efficiency of that hammer was say 83%, your correction factor to that blow count value of eight would be 1.38. So it'd be equivalent to a blow count of 11 normalized for 60% efficiency. So if you look at various engineering correlations, you might have an idea that blow count of eight is a medium stiff clay and it could put you close to the stiff range by applying the correction. So it's also used having corrected blow count values is particularly important in liquefaction studies in general sandy materials that are saturated that have a blow count in 60 equivalent of over 30 blows per foot are generally considered to be non-liquefiable. So again, if you collected blow count values with a hammer that was more efficient than 60%, you would have, let's say, something that had a 60, you would have something that uh, perhaps had a blow count of 30 or more normalized for 60% efficiency but if you used a higher efficiency hammer, your blow counts would be below 30 blows per foot, which could suggest the potential for liquefaction if those blow counts were corrected, normalized for 60% efficiency. We often calibrate the hammers on multiple rigs on a given day. As I mentioned earlier, it only adds about five minutes to each sample interval, the time it takes to screw on the subassembly, connect the cables, and reverse the process when sampling has been completed. So it's quite efficient. We normally like to go to a depth of at least 30 feet below grade and pick soil materials that have a range of blow counts, say between 10 and 40 blows per foot. We don't want to collect all our samples on essentially refusal blow counts of over 50. And you don't want really soft or loose material because then your drill rod can run and you run the risk of stripping off your gauges, particularly the accelerometers uh, on your drill rod. You know, oftentimes in this example, they were using solid stem augers, but sometimes they use hollow stem augers. I was on a job in Hawaii where I was performing SPT hammer calibration in hollow stem augers and uh, didn't realize that uh, there was the potential to encounter lava tubes in these particular borings. And uh, they broke into one of these lava tubes while they were sampling and the drill rod dropped about four feet and sheared my accelerometer, sheared all my cables did about $6,000 worth of damage uh, instantly. So again, you don't want scenarios where the drill rod can run and potentially strip off and damage uh, the cables and gauges and so on. So keep that in mind. If you have any questions about this process, please let me know in the comments section and please stay tuned for future videos. Thanks very much.